Yeah, we're on, huh? Okay. Thank you for those who made the trek. I know it's a long drive. Uh, we have a bunch of photo share and we have a speaker. And I have a couple of announcements. Um, one, the June challenge is... Uh, getting close up, getting as close as you can to your subject. That should be no problem for Tom because he's always in the middle of the flower. But, uh, and it can be macro, it can be just, just close up. Doesn't really, doesn't really matter. Um, Sue has uh, graciously allowed herself to be talked into being a featured photographer in the next newsletter. Oh, she groans. <laughs> Not desperate. Um, I have one left over. Anybody belong to this? Thumb drive from, I guess, last meeting? Doesn't look familiar, huh? Okay, they're not here. I don't think we have any special announcements. Who is going to introduce our speaker? And we look forward to hearing from them. Sue, go ahead. Morning. Um, this started a couple of, well, before the holidays, I had contacted the Department of Wildlife and Resources. And after a uh, while, I got the president, the board president, and it trickled down. And I received a message from Megan Marchetti, who was the creative content producer at the the Virginia Department of Wildlife and Resources. And she could not be here, uh, but she highly recommended our guest speaker, who is uh, Mike Roberts. And she says he's a renowned name in the field of wildlife photography and he'd be ideal for your club. He possesses a vast array of stunning images and a depth of knowledge that he loves to share. His outstanding work is frequently featured in our Virginia Wildlife Magazine. Also, um, he's an experienced public speaker with many years of uh, photographing model. So please help us welcome our guest speaker today, Mr. Mike Roberts. Thank you. Okay. First of all, can you hear me okay? Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> Sue, I have to tell you this. Growing up in a very rural part of Virginia, Bedford County, it was rural at the time, my biggest fear in life was standing in front of two people. <laughs> and it took me a long, a, a long, long time to get over that. But thankfully, between God and um, a principal in an elementary school, uh, I finally beat that. First of all, thank you for the invitation. It's always a pleasure uh, to share some of the things I've learned with people some of whom know a lot more than I know. And I guess as photographers, it, it's sort of a, a dangerous zone for me because uh, I've never had a photography class in my life. This is a self-taught deal for me. Uh, but I did have a, a gracious, a great mentor. But um, there are some of you that know a whole lot more about photography than I did, than I do. But I used my photography primarily for years as a teaching tool because um, growing up in rural Bedford County, my mother, um, and, and I really give her the honor of this, uh, when I was a youngster, she subscribed to some magazines, some you probably don't get, uh, Field and Stream, Outdoor Life, and whatever, because, hey, living in the country, uh, I lived a long way from school, I wasn't involved in sports, and, hey, I spent my life outdoors. And I found out it was another classroom for me. And through those years, I began to see the name of a person, and that man changed my life. And I'll, I'll share that in just a moment. But there's one photograph I'd like to start with, if I could, Sue. Uh, and I've never started a program without this. And when I walk into a, a library or a school to speak, and I don't see this, my, my heart's broken a little bit. And it's coming up.
we'll get there. There it is. Um, how can I say this? Um, we're living in some pretty tough times in America right now. Um, people in my family uh, gave a lot. And, and this flag still, to me, represents an opportunity of what I'm doing today. Uh, without there, there are still countries that I could not get up and do what I'm doing. You could not assemble. So I never start a program without thanking God that I live in a country that gives me this, uh, this particular opportunity. But, and if you want to flip it, Sue, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. How many of you are into outdoor photography, wildlife photography? Um, um, and, and I know I heard, I heard the chatter. I heard I'm, I'm always listening because I'm a birder and I listen to birds. So I listen to people. But when I mean, I was a kid. I mean, I was like um, six, seven, eight years old. My mother subscribed to these magazines and I kept seeing the name under all these photographs, the credit line. Leonard Lee Rue the third. Now that's you know, that's a pretty impressive name. Leonard Lee Rue R U E the third. And, and by the way, you can look him up. He passed away three years ago at age ninety six. But uh, this was the most published wildlife photographer in America. He traveled all continents. He photographed every continent. And I met him many years ago. My my goal in life was to meet this man. Because I wondered, how did he get all those great wildlife photographs? And my dream came true. Dreams do come true in America. And we became the very best of friends. And uh, he changed my life. He was the author of over 40 books on wildlife. You can still get his books. They're still available. Go online. Just look up Rue Wildlife Photography, and you can see a lot of his images. But um, And you can flip over uh, a little bit more. We spent a lot of time together. Uh, some of the most cherished parts of my life were with this man. And uh, again, when I say dreams can come true, they really can. Okay. Uh, photography to me started in the backyard. <laughs> now, I love to travel across the country uh, from coast to coast, uh, east, west, north, south. But, you know, photography in the backyard the colors that you can obtain there. And the, the thing about photography to me, it's not just the subject, it's learning about the subject. Because if you're gonna photograph at a bird feeder, you don't want the bird on a feeder. Holy mackerel, you wanna give that, you wanna make that bird the most glorious creature there is. And you watch where the bird perches, you can set up, uh, you can set up a blind. Any of, have you ever, you ever photographed, photographed out of a photography blind? Okay, here's one. Now, if you want to have some fun, uh, if you saw my eyes today when I came in, I have what's called kingfisher eyes right now. Uh, I'm setting in a blind. In fact, if I was not here today, I would be setting in a blind along a stream in Bedford County because I'm photographing kingfishers. That means sometimes I have to drive an hour before dawn. I have to get in the blind before dawn. And sometimes I sit five and six hours. And by the middle of the day, you know, you're, you start to get these bags under your eyes when you've done it for two or three weeks. So, uh, and, and people say, oh, would you give me a wildlife photograph? And I said, do you know what that cost me of my life in hours? No, I will not give you that photograph. If you would like to purchase that photograph, you get the picture. But, uh, and you can scroll through there. Um, just the colors, you know, the, the birds are so exciting. And uh, I'll just, I'll say this right here. Uh, my bread and butter lens for bird photography, and, and with birds, you have to be very careful when they're nesting. Uh, you can't interrupt their nesting cycle, and, and you never clip limbs, you know, to get to the eggs in the nest because that, that's just inviting disaster. But birds are called wild birds for a good reason. They're wild, and they like to avoid humans, except when there's food there. So if you're feeding birds in your backyard, and you want it, if you want an introduction into wildlife photography, that's, that is the best place to start in your backyard. Um, my bread and butter lens for photographing birds, and I'm a Canon guy. I know there are a lot of Nikon people out there, and, and I know the world's going mirrorless and blah, 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 but uh, I'm still a Canon guy. I bought a new DX1 Mark III 
love it except one thing. The megapixels are, are lousy. You know, it drops it down to 20. My old uh, 5D Mark IV, you know, that's up to 30. And if you enlarge a 20 megapixel, and if you enlarge the 30, it, it still holds it uh, most of the enlargement process. But um, my birds are going to be sharp because, um, you know, I never keep bad photographs. And I hope you don't either. You know, you put that delete button. Now, I started photography when you had to know photography, <laughs> not graphic arts. Um, I do everything to make my photograph the best it can be when I take it. I'm not saying I don't crop. I'm not saying I don't maybe move a stop up or back or, or maybe add just a little saturation. If the, but to take a lousy picture and to make it a, that's graphics. Uh, I'm a photographer. I learned that. You can go ahead and, and scoot up there. Uh, and by the way, it's okay to photograph this particular bird rather than having on a bird feeder. You know, I grew some sunflowers, saved that, put them out, and I think that made a pretty pleasing image. So rather than your birds on your feeder, and if you want to do it as an example, as a study shot, it's okay. But if I'm photographing birds, I don't want that feeder there. I want something that uh, looks a little more natural. And you can see where that bird eats. So you can go soon. Uh, color. Oh, you got to get this color. Now, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm one that likes to zoom in. I like to do portraits. And the other thing, if you'll notice on my photographs, uh, I try to shoot uh, basically uh, to keep that aperture uh, as wide as I can because I, I want my subject to be I want, I want you to look at the bird. Now, I'm not saying I won't do scenics where everything has to be detailed, you know, your depth of field. But when I'm photographing birds, I want you to pay attention to the bird, like this blue jay. And by the way, I hope you know blue jays aren't blue. They're black. Uh, what you're seeing there is a refraction, of, a refraction of light because the bird's feathers will not absorb the blue color. Anything you see blue in nature, indigo, bunnings, whatever, they're not blue, they're black. You're seeing the reflected light back to your eyes there. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, and you can go ahead. Uh, hummers, I, I spent a lot of time photographing hummingbirds. But again, notice that background. You know, if that thing has weeds and stems, and it just it takes away from the photograph. And those of you that photograph wildflowers, you're a wildflower guy, I heard, and you're a nature guy, um, sometimes you like the scenics with the subject to show where it's living. But man, when I do a ruby-throated hummingbird with that flashy red gorget uh, and, and the flower, I don't want something in the background to take away from it. Go ahead. Um, and, and you're lucky sometimes. You know, I, this is what I call this the waiting line because the, the pollinators and that fire pink and the female ruby throat there, uh, you, you just get lucky with some photographs sometimes. You have to make your own luck with, with the birds, though. Uh, this indigo bunny, again, that, that bird is not black or is not blue. Uh, you're just looking at the light that's refracted and, and reflected, and you can see the color of the light because the feathers do not absorb the blue color. So you're just seeing a reflection of light there. Okay. And um, the warblers, if you're into birds, this time of year, uh, the neotropicals have come back, most of them from Central and South America. And it's learning where they are, where they're nesting. And this chestnut sided warbler is a classic example. And, and again, you can see that blurry background. And that's because I'm using a, a very shallow depth of field. Okay. Now, when I'm outdoors, I, I try to become as invisible as possible. I'm going to dress in camo. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to use a blind, and I don't know if you know the Trago Pan company that makes the blinds. They are actually photography blinds. Most blinds that people photograph out of are hunting blinds. Uh, they're they're not made for photography. This company actually makes photography blinds, and they're outstanding except for one thing. They're too small. Now, you can sit in this for an hour or two, and when you get out, if, you know, the older I get, and I, I hit that 74 year this year, in a couple of weeks, I'll be 74, and when I get out of sitting there for two hours in my chair, and you got to be comfortable sitting, uh, when you get out of that, I can't hardly walk. So I want a blind that's large enough that I can move around. Sometimes I have to have my little 
pee bottle, you know, if you sit there long enough, because those birds see you. This is put up at nighttime. I never put a blind up in the day. Uh, this is done after dark, and um, basically, I was photographing grasshopper sparrows here. That's the cool little bird that nests in grass. But uh, just as an example, and you can go one more there. Uh, and if I'm photographing very elusive birds like kingfishers and that I'm doing right now, or waterfowl in particular, they don't know I'm there. I go in after dark. Uh, I put up a portable blind, but uh, I put up four uh, metal T posts. And around that, I wrap uh, grass. And you can buy these at stores in town, particularly Bass Pro or or probably the uh, green top, and and I will actually, and it's it's grass that duck hunters use to camouflage their boats with, and I'll use that to wrap that blind, except for the opening there. I'll actually paint it to match the the area that the grass, whether it's brown or green, depending on the time of the year. So getting a good photograph to me, half the fun is getting ready to do it. I mean, it you cannot you you can't take too many. Uh, you just have to put a lot of effort into it. At least I do. And if I do something, I want to do it as 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 well as as possible. Okay. So that gives you a little bit of picture. Now, um, some of you are wondering how in the world did I get involved with their fishing game? I'm not I'm not part of fishing game, but I still represent that agency because they are that's the agency that's responsible for the welfare of our natural resources, our wildlife resources in Virginia. And they have one heck of a job. Um, I retired from Babcock and Wilcox, the nuclear fuel industry, after 30 years of work there. Uh, we made the nuclear components for the Navy submarines. I was very proud of that work. Um, I retired at 50 to do something that I could have never dreamed of. Because, again, growing up, I couldn't stand in front of two people to talk. But I started an organization an educational organization, and I went into schools across Virginia. I did a lot right here in Richmond. Uh, I worked in Indiana for three years, and I think I covered some nine states, but most of it was in Virginia, in Indiana. And in that tenure, uh, I did programs in schools for teachers and, and, and students to the tune of over 450,000. And every student got to hear the North, Amer North American conservation model, uh, the, the details that restored our wildlife. Because what most people don't realize in America, uh, 400 years ago, this was a true wilderness. You know, there was no Richmond here. It was a fabulous wilderness. There were elk here, there were bison, there were gray wolves, there were cougar. There, This was a wild place. And in a tune of less than 300 years, our forest had been, uh, stripped. Um, our wildlife was gone, uh, primarily because of European uh, colonists that came in and its population expanded. Hey, they had to survive. So what did they do? And, and you can't blame those people. Do you know why? Because if we had lived there in that time, we would have done the very same thing. We have the benefit of history, of being able to look back and see what was done incorrectly in terms of using a natural environment. Um, I put this photograph up here for a reason. I don't have a photograph of this bird. Um, it's called the passenger pigeon. At one point in America's history, 200, 200 years ago, there were some three to six billion passenger pigeons in North America. Most of them from the Midwest East. And um, today there are absolutely none that are extinct. The last passenger pigeon died in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1932. Uh, how did we lose 30, or how did we lose three to six billion passenger pigeons? Well, and by the way, um, I always thought this funny or ironic. It, it was not funny to me, but I would go into schools and ask youngsters about, um, have you ever heard of John James Audubon? Well, teachers didn't know John James Audubon. And if you're a birder, you have to know Audubon because of the Audubon Society. But he was the guy that painted the birds of America. He was a great naturalist. But Audubon said, and, and this, is, this is a quote, uh, when he was in Kentucky, he once saw a flock of passenger pigeons that took two days to pass over. They blocked the sun 
it was like clouds had formed. And that's, that's what three to six billion of these birds mean. But the thing about it is uh, they were hunted. Um, and by 1932, the last bird, and her name was Martha, and she died in the Cincinnati Zoo. So, and you, you can roll it to the, the thing about it, we were so fortunate uh, understand, prior to 1900, there were no laws in America that protected our natural resources. And then along comes this man. Everybody know this guy? Yeah. Um, sometimes I, I say, I'd like to, I'm not going to talk about politics, but I'd say I'd like to have him back because he did some fantastic things. But um, Teddy, Theodore Roosevelt, was quite responsible for a lot of the changes. He, he was the first birder in the White House. He loved birds. He loved the outdoors. He started the, the very first conservation organization. Remember, there was none of this in America. But in, eight, no, in 1887, he started an organization called the Boone and Crockett Club. And they were the first conservationists in America. And you can flip the switch there. Um, today, they're headquartered out in Missoula, Montana. But uh, this was the very first conservation organization in America. And you can go to the next one. Now, if you like birds, as I do, and spend some time in the Everglades and uh, up and down the, the eastern shore of Virginia, all the way down to Florida. But this is, this is a, uh, a really unique bird, uh, the egrets. And, and there are all kinds of species from the grapes. But, but this little guy, and, and how can I say this without making it sound, well, I want to make it sound as bad as it was. Uh, early in America's history, people hunted these birds for the aigrettes, the feathers. And one ounce of gold in 1932, or in 1929, was $32 per ounce. The same weight of egret feathers was worth more than gold. Now, what that meant is people went out in the swamps and hunted the birds. Now, now ladies, I have to pin you on this one uh, because it became so fashionable to wear the egrets. The breeding feathers at the worst time of the year to hunt these birds because they were at the rookeries feeding, having in the breeding season, laying eggs, uh, incubating, having their babies. And that's when the men, that was us, trying to make money, trying to survive, went out in the swamps, hunted the birds, killed them for these feathers. Uh, consequently, and it wasn't just, you can switch, it wasn't just the gaudy birds like this rosate spoonbill. <laughs> We're going up. We really wanted to come down. Um, we lost something here. Oh, it'll come back, okay. I'll continue here for just a moment. Uh, people hunted birds of every species for their feathers, um, whether they were the, the game birds or whether they were, um, and you can flip it, birds in your backyard were hunted, even seagulls for the feathers. And consequently, bird populations began to go down, and you can flip it. And, and here's one, everybody recognizes the American robin, did you know you could go, you can still go online today and find the recipe for robin pie? Because we ate these as a nation. We hunted birds to sustain our lives. Now today, you know, nobody in their right mind would have robin pie. But I just wanted you to know, there's a classic example. Um, these birds were hunted, all birds. Uh, mockingbirds, um, cardinals were trapped. Mockingbird populations diminished so quickly um, because people kept them in cages as songbirds. Even Thomas Jefferson kept them. So um, just understand, we've come a long ways, baby, when it comes to our wildlife. But you go back to, uh, and you, don't, you can go forward here. Uh, you can go back to the Boone and Crockett Club. In 1905, the Audubon Society was started. Uh, then in 1918, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act uh, and, and I think I have a photograph of a wood duck here. Our waterfowl in America, when the Europeans first came, was quite abundant. But there was one bird that wasn't as migratory. They lived up and down the stream in, here in Richmond. Um, they were called wood ducks, the most colorful uh, duck that we have. But because they nested in hollow trees, we cut the trees, 
Uh, we drained the swamps, and we hunted those birds 365 days a year. And by about 1900, wood ducks were on the, if we had had an endangered species list, they would have been an endangered species. And finally, in 1918, the United States and Canada signed an agreement to protect migratory birds. And today it, it goes to Mexico as well. But um, this period, around, right, right around the early 1900s, is what changed it all. So if you're photographing wildlife, you owe the people that made a difference. It, it goes back to, um, all the way back to uh, 1900 and the Lacey Act. That was the first law ever passed in North America, the Lacey Act. It was passed by Congress, and it meant if you were in Montana hunting, and I, I'm a hunter, I have to admit that, I do some hunting. If I break a law in Montana and I come to Virginia, I, I still break that first law, the Lacey Act, and I, I'm liable to that today. So just understand that it's taken a, a long time to graduate to where we are today, and you can go through there. Um, this is the one that made the difference, and I share this because Virginia played a big role in it. Um, in 1932, two men, uh, Key Pittman from Nevada, a senator, and you can roll it, and the next man, anybody know this man? I know you've heard his name. He was a legislator right here in Richmond. His name was A. Willis Robertson. You ever heard of A. Willis? Anybody? Anybody heard of A. Willis Robertson? He was a lawyer from Lexington. Uh, but he was, uh, he served in the State House in Richmond. He later became a, became a congressman. In 1932, uh, in 1937, these two men knew they had to do something because America's wildlife resources were going down. White-tailed deer, unimaginable. When the Europeans came, there were some 13 by 1900. They were gone. They would have been an endangered species. Uh, the pronghorn, 30 million, gone. Uh, elk, 10 million, gone from Virginia. The last elk in Virginia was killed in 1855 up in Clark County by Colonel Gostoli. That was the last indigenous elk recorded killed in Virginia. Uh, wild turkey. I'll, see, when you do school programs, you have to make funny noises. So we're kids at heart. So if I'm doing owls, I do turkeys as well. But 10 million wild turkey. When I grew up, I never saw a wild turkey because there were none. Luckily, our fish and game agency, which I, I do, um, I represent, represent them with pride, not through employment, but through association. I uh, had a very good friend named Kit Schaefer, who was the biologist who trapped the turkeys, who released them in every county in Virginia, and today we have more, they're everywhere for me to photograph and hunt, because I love to photograph turkeys, I love to watch them, I love to eat them, I love, you, you get the picture. But uh, in 1937, A. Willis Robertson, Key Pittman introduced a bill to Congress, and I would go into a school, I would go into a school and tell this, and I would watch teachers, and their smiles became frowns. But you want to tell the story. You want to tell the truth. In 1937, knowing we needed money in America to restore our wildlife, they introduced a bill called the Federal Aid, Federal Aid to Wildlife Restoration Act. And here's what it said. Anybody own a firearm in this? Any, any of you own a firearm? Okay, a couple, three, at least those that admit it. And four. Uh, if you go out today and buy a firearm and you buy a box of ammunition, you're still supporting the Federal Aid and Wildlife Restoration Act. The bill they submitted to Congress and passed in less than four months, imagine that, said for every firearm sold in America, every box of ammunition sold in America, the U.S. government would collect a tax of 11%, and that money could be used for one thing only, and that would be restoring America's wildlife. Hmm. That's when America's wildlife began. Because now we have, all of a sudden we have biologists, we have the word conservation there, we have the money, and it took a lot of hard work to restore that. Today, wood duck populations are back. We have more white-tailed deer in America, particularly in Virginia, than we ever had. Uh, our elk population's gone back to over a million. We have, in Virginia, elk, 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 those wild turkeys are abundant everywhere. So, And it wasn't just that. Oh, and by the way, uh, Here's something I make, need to make sure you understand. 
Sportsmen were the original conservationists. They still pay the bill today. If you're a photographer like me, I pay absolutely nothing to support wildlife. I don't pay a tax on binoculars. I don't pay a tax on fire, or I don't pay a tax on camera equipment. Uh, and just I just went through purchasing a bunch of things, thousands and thousands of dollars, and none of that supports. So even if you think hunting is wrong, and there are people who believe that, that's in America. You know, we have opinions. We can believe things. But the thing about it is they were the original conservationists. They still put money in it today, not for restoration, but for education. A lot of the money that our Fish and Game Agency receives in Richmond comes from the Federal Aid Wildlife Restoration Act. And that is very, very important with non-game species. Uh, it's important to educate youngsters today. And I know because I've been the recipient of some of those dollars through the years. Okay. Uh, and again, it was just through it was just through uh, an excise tax on on firearms and ammunition. Today it bleeds over into archery, it bleeds over into fishing, and you can go through. Now I I like wildflowers. I'm not a wildflower enthusiast, but I love wildflowers to capture the color of our natural environment. Here I'm I'm typically gonna use a macro lens or whatever. But um, sometimes I'll use, you know, even a 24 to 70. And, and I do the zooming instead of, you know, I, I'm going in and out. Try to catch some of the environment there. Um, gosh, we just came through the latest slipper deal. And, and we could talk for hours about this, but this is one of my favorite plants, um, primarily because it, it takes four or five years for it to bloom. It doesn't bloom every year. It's really unique in the fact that it has a symbiotic relationship with a fungus, and that fungus basically supplies, supplies uh, moisture and nutrients to the plant, and the plant feeds the fungus. But it's kind of unique. It has a, a blossom that uh, that has a, a, a pretty fragrant smell, but it has no pollen. And the only pollinator is bumblebee, because only bumblebees are strong enough to push into the, the blossom there. It has a one-way exit. Uh, entrance and exit, the bumblebee has to come out of the top. The bumblebee gets really fretted because there's no pollen there. Uh, there there's no uh, nectar there. But when the bumblebee goes to the next one, it helps to pollinate it. But they're really unique. Some are pink, some are yellow. Uh, these are mostly going to be in the mountains there. But gosh, don't you love the colors? And, and oh, there's a bumblebee on a fox glove. Sometimes you get lucky and catch a little motion, you know. Uh, you may not have a your shutter fast enough to catch the motion, but you can see the pollinating, you know, the baskets on his pollen baskets on his leg. And, oh, I just love it. Now, I love insects. I grew up, don't throw rocks at me, I grew up collecting bugs. I have at home my 4-H pen because I collected insects. Now, I've been raked over coal through the years. You should not kill those insects. And I said, well, then why are you driving your car through rural Virginia when the swallowtails are hatching because your grill is decorated with them. That's why they're, you know, they have so many uh, each year to keep the numbers up because everything in the world eats insects. But I don't mount insects any longer, but uh, I love to photograph them, whether they're Hercules beetles or, or the Cropia moth caterpillars, you can go ahead. And, um, now, here's something about the photograph. I could have taken that moth with its wings fully spread. It's our largest silk moth we have in North America, the Cecropia, about six inch wingspan. That's too long, maybe like that. And but I wanted to show those antennae because when these guys are, when they come out of their cocoon in late May and June, they, there's only one generation a year. You know, lots of insects have two or three generations annually. This one has one one generation annually, but those. Those antennae are receptors because the male can sense the pheromones from a mile away to find it. So that's kind of what I do with the target to, to share that with young person. And again, we're all young part. And the loon. And we just learned something about this. Who doesn't like a loon ball? Um, those trailing tails. But we learned something about that not too awfully long ago. Bats love insects. And they fly around at night, as do the silk moths. And bats love silk moths. But they find their food through echolocation. But what we found out is when this guy flies, 
Those tails were fluttering, creating noise and sound waves, and the bat keys in on the tails instead of the head. That's very important to survival. So if you see this guy missing tails, it's because the bat can fly attack the tails that are fluttering to create those sound waves that the bat makes. Oh, and I only got to talk about monarch. I love these guys. Um, I've long wanted to go into Mexico and see the where they spend the winter, but just to see them coming back right now, uh, to spend the winter there, it's bad that I want to go into Mexico and can't do it right. And to get a good toad photograph, you know, you, you can get turned. You know, you got to lay down on the book. Uh, I wish I had a photograph of me taking that photograph. And basically, you know, I laid in the mud and I had to make the same sound as that toad to get him to think I was another male toad. And he reacted. You get that toad. Okay. That's me. It's the same. You didn't think I could do that, did you? Uh, oh, oh, you got to go back. The hardest photograph I ever took. Somewhere. Oh, no. Oh, right there. Oh, okay. Sorry. And now you go one more. Uh, bullfrog oh, cup. I took this photograph neck deep in the water with, with my tripod and a ten thousand dollar lens <laughs> eye level with that bullfrog. And why he let me do that, I'm not sure. You can see the duckweed there, but everything else is out of out of focus. But hey, I got that little catch. Hey, if you're photographing wildlife and you don't have to catch flies now, you need to do that photograph, delete it. Because, because of that shows light. That cat light shows light. Okay. okay. And I'm a snake fanatic, you know. My dad thought I was crazy. My wife didn't even let me bring them in the house. Not sure why. But um, anyway, I, I, I love reptiles and amphibians as well. And pikers and whatever. If it's moving and it's covered with scales, feathers, or fur, I'm at it. And it doesn't have to be a huge deal. It could be a little pike, and these guys live up in high elevations. They require cool temperatures. They're farmers, they cut grass all summer, and they store it in a little cavity that dries like hay. That's what they feed on all winter. And last year, I was lucky enough to catch one calling or, or squalling, or whatever they do. They, they make really unique calls. But that's the really fun thing about photography and yellow bellied Mormons. You've got to be up high in the mountains of the west to get these. You can go ahead. And you know, no, for all the a lot of photographs. Now, I didn't get this one to the backyard. This is a, a, a mountain top tail, and I know that by see all the hair in the ears. Look at the rabbits in your backyard. They won't have hair in their ears because it's, it's pretty warm here. But these guys live in a cold climate. And fox squirrels. And look, that log with no accident, that's in my backyard. You know what I keep in that log? Yep, yep, acorns and, and walnuts. And uh, consequently, I get fox rolls and get my So, so you, you can, can really, if you understand, you, you can, can bring, bring wildlife, wildlife to you. And uh, then, then sometimes, sometimes you have to go to them. And I love the canes, the wild dogs, the, the red foxes. Oh, I could tell you an hour and a half here. I photographed, I photographed the red fox in Yellowstone. I followed him for over four hours at a distance because I'm shooting a 600 millimeter lens. And the thing about it, I caught him doing everything foxes do. I wanted that photograph, and he wouldn't do that. He wouldn't sit down. After four hours, I was headed to the truck. I turned around, and he's sitting on the tail watching me leave. So I turned around, went down a little bit, came up, and he was actually watching a bison up on the hill. And I moved about uh, 10 yards closer, set up, and I went like, like a mouse. Click, click. That was the last shot. Okay, that, that, that's cool. And, and sometimes, sometimes you like to close. You know, they're hunting mice bowls in the snow. You can go ahead. And, and sometimes, sometimes they don't. You know, you, hey, you got to have that back shutter to catch that. Go ahead. And sometimes, sometimes you get, get that dome, you know, hard long or vertical. Um, they have the keenest sense of hearing of any animal. It's amazing. Now, this came last year. I told a farmer friend of mine, I said, look, if you ever find a fox den, give me a call. Two days later, he said, Mike, I got some foxes on a roll pal. So I went over and set up one of those little fancy blinds and set it in for six hours. And while I was sitting there, I said, oh, I wish one would come out under that, where that uh, hole is under the front porch and the underpinning there. I think, no, there he is. And click, 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 I got the photograph. 
Pay the dirt. If you're not paid, even with flowers, people, flowers, people, people think flowers don't lose. Flowers, 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 flowers are perpetual motion. motion. I mean, I mean look, look out there, you see those trees out there just doing a little bit of this? Well, if you're photographing wildflowers, they're not doing that. They're doing this if you're in close on them. Sticking with slow speed. Tired. We can talk about tides. Uh, wolves. Hey, this is a patient deal. I was in Yellowstone a couple of years ago and found an old bison deal. And lo and behold, while I was there, a wolf came. And uh, we won't go on that controversial subject. And that was not Alan. He's actually chewing on a piece of bone. And I sat there and watched and watched. I'm sitting on one side of the Madison River. And this is about 60 yards beyond the Madison River. And I thought, man, I was really good to get that, really lucky to get that photograph. Go ahead. Now, she stopped, and I thought I was going to leave. And she looked at me and goes, the wolf came to the opposite bank and started eating water. Now, dogs lap water with their tongues. Wolves bite them. And that's what they splash. They just bite it. And I kept sitting there, you know, and I finally got to me the photograph. That was just, I love the intensity of the eyes. There's no animal that has no mammal that has look in their eyes like that. Go ahead. Uh, I photographed everything. Pronghorn, mute. No, you can just roll it. Mule deer, uh, moose. I love those little, little big old gangly moose. Uh, all times of the year, that's a cool deal. Go ahead. You can just roll through here. Oh, the grizzlies. Look. How many of you? I know a lot of them. You've been to Yellowstone many times. Um, we owe that park a lot. It was our first national park, and it has a wonderful history. That there are lots of people that visit. I'm talking to millions and millions more than ever visited. And a lot of people that go there do not understand that's where those animals live. And there's a visitor, and you can't encroach. Two years ago, I watched a young lady get out of a vehicle with a cell phone. That was a mom, really, and two. Yearly does, and, and they only stayed with mom two years. years. And, and he crossed the parking lot, he walked up on the bank, and, and as he was pointing her camera, guess what? The foul is she, she ran toward her, could have killed her easily, uh, uh, chose not to, it was a bluff charge. But someone videoed this, and they sent it to the park service. He can't, can't go back to the park. Now, there's been people do silly things in that park. Uh, we could write a book on that. So we, we have, have a responsibility, responsibility even when it comes to photographs, bare, 100 yards minimum, and look like 600, I'm okay with that. Um, bears and wolves, everything, everything else is 25, 25 yards. That's too close for, for running elk and what have you, but go ahead there. This, this is one of my favorite grizzly photographs. Look at those big claws. Now, there's, there's, a, there's a predator. If you look what it just killed, if you look to the left, you can see that mass instead of the antler of that bull elk. Uh, what, a, what a wonderful opportunity that I got to see that. Okay. Now, yeah. Shenandoah, have you ever go to Shenandoah? Wildflower, I'm assuming. Uh, and it has lots of great wildflowers. But um, big matter that I'm up there every June. This is, I, I love the photograph of white tail deer. And you can see what people, people tell me all the time those balls are born odorless. <laughs> hey, if you're breathing, you're not odorless. And if you go to the bathroom, you're not over. But, but mom, mom cleans this little guy. She, she licks the rectum, rectum the genitals. Basically, basically they remove all the urine and all of the fecal material because, because they're bear, coyote, and bobcat. Well, well bobcat's bobcat a visual hunter, but the bear, the coyote, they're, they're looking for these little guys in the spring. They know they're born. And, and a lot of them don't make it because of that. They're mortality rate. Okay. Um, we, we could talk, talk about it all forever. Really. Oh, it's, it's one of my, it's one of the sciences. You know, deer are the only mammals that, that grow projection of, of antler and lose them each year. It's a fabulous cycle. Uh, and again, we could talk about that for hours. But just to capture those guys, that was my favorite white tail shot from last year. Uh, just a beautiful buck. And it doesn't have to be in the summer or fall. Go there when it's cold, bitter. You know, you got to take some special precautions with your equipment, particularly batteries. But, um, man, I love the cold weather shots. And I like the black every now and then. You know, not for wildflowers, but particularly for uh, wildlife. Um, I said the last elk in Virginia was killed in 1855. 11 years ago, 
Um, Virginia reintroduced elk back into the state in southwest Virginia. And I've been very fortunate to photograph these guys for several years. And, you know, they make the magazine covers. But when I do school programs, I have the elk bugle. And, you know, I get to bugle. That's a wonderful sound. I don't think we want to do it at the library. But uh, I, you can just roll through these. That's an unusual photo. This is one of my favorites. I was in Yellowstone. The worst weather. I took about a four-mile hike. I uh, didn't see a lot of wildlife, but I saw this. And, uh, the wind was blowing. It was drifting. And I could just see the story where the wolves had killed that elk and consumed it. And that's all the remains left me to see and probably the year before. But this as photographer, that's what we're looking for, photographed out of the norm. This is unusual because I've never photographed a fawn and a mature bull. That was a very late fawn, by the way. Oh, not a fawn, but a cat with the spots. Now, yeah. I'm not, not saying, saying everything, everything has to be uh, focused in, in, in terms of, of uh, maybe just the an animal, animal and everything else, a blur. blur. Sometimes, Sometimes you want some detail, uh, like this elk, that, that tree, tree and, and the sagebrush. And, uh, uh, I try to use the rule of third. You can see the, the elk's on a third, the tree's on a third, and the elk's on a third, and blah, blah, blah. You, you know, that's the old stuff. Everybody does that. And, and don't, don't just do it when the weather's great. Go out there and ugly stuff. stuff. Get, Get one of those big covers, covers you know, weather, weather covers we put on your, over your lens, lens and your camera, and you'll be okay. Just have to be careful with your batteries. And by the way, sometimes wildlife tells you when you're too close. And this goes back to a period in history when elk, and a lot of people don't realize this, they have two special teeth, uh, upper jaw. Uh, they're like canines because those people who believe in the fact that wildlife uh, goes through an evolution millions of years. Uh, these animals once had teeth, uh, these long canines, they're aggressive now. They still have them, they're called ivories, and they, they didn't even have a deer, they didn't have antlers. they had these long ivories. There's a deer in China called the tusk deer that has canines this long, still has them, doesn't have antlers. Um, but He's showing me where his canine would have been. And they're actually there. You can't see them hit by his jaw, but that big bull said, hey, that's close enough. And I I adhere to his advice. Okay. Favorite, you know, people ask me, what are your favorite animal photographs? Big horn sheep, not to talk to the animal, but where you have to find them in the, in the high mountains. And gosh, this was just a fantastic uh, specimen. His horns were not groomed. Typically, when these guys, um, when, when their, their horns horn start to grow and they mature, they, they break, break the ends off because it, it, it interferes with the peripheral vision because they are prey species and they're cougar and they're wolves. But, but this one, his horns flared out, so he didn't break them off. And um, just a, a great sense. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and we're all there. There's that handsome wood duck that we talked about, and, and they're, they're very common in the ego. Oh, an owl, man, I'm an owl fanatic. Look, Look at those eyes. This, this is a great one now. The funny part is, he's actually part facing away from me and, and with his head turned toward me because, because they, they can, can rotate, rotate their, their head over 180 degrees, degrees in both directions, which is effectively gives them 360 degree vision. They have 11 extra bones in their neck. They have their flight feathers are so, you know, they're, they're uh, basically uh, serrated and the air goes through them and set up and over like a pigeon to make an oil when they're flying. Uh, and, and they're, they're drab. But, but this, this is a day, this is a Dion bird. Uh, they hunt at night, but, and, and they're so forgiving of human presence, but the great gray owl, one of my favorites. Okay. Um, as a photographer, there are things that basically we go for years that we don't get. Uh, Woodcock is a game bird in Virginia, and some of them nest here. And I've never been lucky enough, enough to find a nest until, until last year. And I, I went there to photograph, and I photographed the eggs, a pin on the nest, and blah, blah, blah. The, the last day I went, and, and the eggs, they had hatched. And I was kind of heartbroken. And, and I just happened to look over to the left, and there was mom rooting the babies. And it gave me a fabulous photograph. Okay. And I did get to photograph the sage grouse, the greater sage grouse in Montana. It's a, a great, great stage trout. And their, and their numbers, numbers are down, down not from over hunting, but because of, of losing that, that those unbelievable stretches of sage that they have to have, have not because, because of um, whatever, whatever, but because, because conifers are pushing the sage out. 
and that affects the type of insect that are there. That's a pulse of this little guy. And I could share the stories on this. So it, uh, when I got in the blind that morning, uh, cold field went up and down because uh, when at, I got in my blind at 4 a.m. and I was sitting there, and the birds started flying in in the darkness. And when it got daylight, there were 40 males in front of me booming. Oh, it was awesome. They're great birds. You can see the yellow red out there, air sac. Okay. Now, this is what I'm studying, uh, photographing right now, the kingfisher, one of my favorite birds of all time. Yeah. Uh, they nest in a cavity in the stream bank. Sometimes, and with that long bill, they chisel that out. Sometimes 10 or 12 feet back, have an enlarged cavity where the female lays her eggs and incubates the babies. Now, I, before you hit the button, you know you get a photograph every now and then that you go wild. Now, this is going to look like it's Photoshop. I don't know how to Photoshop one thing into a photograph. I couldn't do it. My life depended on it. I was sitting there Saturday morning, and the male was going in to feed the female because she's incubating the baby that just passed. And all of a sudden, the female came out and hit the side. Oh, wrong one. This is a pellet. Uh, uh, King creatures are like owls. Like there are some cats that are not strong enough, enough to digest the bone scales, so, so they, they regurgitate a pellet of bone scales. But, but look, look at the, the next, next photo. There, there, she, she came, came out with an egg that had not had, failed to hatch. So, so she, she was, was actually taking it out of the nest to deposit it down the stream. She carried it, she flew back, and went back in to root her baby. So sometimes you get the photograph of the week or your life. Who knows? I'm not sure there's any more. I think that's it. But anyway, um, thank you for having me today. You guys are I'm just an old, washed up now. But I love to spend my life out there all the time, that camera. Uh, it, it's such an opportunity. You never know what's coming down to you. And that, that's the fun part of the part. So, hey, keep it up. Um, I'd love to see some of your wildflowers or some of your uh, Photographs of the photo things that you're taking. Thank you, guys. Oh, I use a 600 millimeter. That's my bread and butter. If I'm doing flour, 100 macros, 24 saturated, where I do the moving in and moving out. But that 100 macro, if that's a one to one lens, it's hard to be. Very seldom I use that to the two. I use it on occasion, but my 600 is if I'm doing birds, that's my. The F4? The F4, yes. The background is so. Yes. Background. Yeah, the backgrounds look almost solid. Yeah. 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 But, but that, that comes from years so of knowing what I want from my photographs. Um, and, and again, I'm, I'm pretty picky. Sometimes I'll get a photograph that looks okay, but that background, background just. I took some yesterday afternoon of Kingfisher, and the wind was blowing the leaves and turning them upside down. The, the bird looked good, but in the background were these white hot spots. And to me, it just did this. So, um, oh, yeah, and you can see, you know, if you want to learn more about Virginia and its natural resources, for 12 bucks a year, this is hard to teach. And that's your cover. And yeah, I got it. I get covers, and, but I write to them every, every, Every two months, so. But uh, our agency, it's a great bunch of people. Uh, they have a big job. It's a very important job. It's a thankless job. But uh, I'm just happy to know a lot of the people within the agency. And they've been good to me, and I try to reciprocate. Thank you, Mike. Well, oh. yeah. Yeah, and hey, I got up at five o'clock to get here this time. <laughs> and a special reward. Oh, wow. Oh, one of our own. Oh, I'll pass this to the Kingfisher line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, good. We should have got you a very soft cushion. Because... Yeah. <laughs> well, that's why I have a director chair that has a nice soft cushion. Yeah. Uh, thank you again. Great. Thank you. Take, a, take a couple minute break. Move around before we do the photo job. Okay. Photo share. Can I want photo share? I want to I want to see your photo. Oh, oh no, no. Oh, I let it Oh, that's Can you photograph all over? Yeah, I do a few wildlife. Oh, you do that? So you are allowed.
If I'm photographing something particular nesting birds, and sometimes, for example, if if they're like these kingfishers, rather than setting up at night on, on nesting kingfishers, I may set the blind up at night 100 yards from the coal to cavity. Uh, two nights later, I might move it 50 yards. And then a couple nights later, I may move it within 30 yards where I can photograph the bird or 20 yards or whatever. Uh, it's really not worth them, you know, just leaving their nest and eggs. Typically, if they have babies, you can get away with it. But uh, sometimes if they're building the hole, excavating the hole, or if they're laying eggs, they'll, they'll abandon them. So you have to just be careful. So you use that 600 F4. Yes. And, and that's how you can use the diagram. Instead of, instead of having that magnificent depth of field to basically well, get the focus of everything in the background, I'll go, I'll shoot, uh, you know, with a large aperture and that, that <laughs> I mean, the, and the, the more, you know, the, the smaller that aperture becomes, the more focused everything behind that bird will be. So I, I typically shoot, I very seldom shoot more than 5.6, maybe four to 600. So, uh, and, and you can practice that in your yard. You can see it. You know, just pick a flower from 20 yards, put the flower out there, and have a background 30 yards behind it, and focus on that flower. And, and use a use a whole range of f stops, and you will see what it. I mean, yeah. first you go, you said six hundred No, no. If, if I'm using a, a, my 600 if I if I have enough lights and I can use that point of view, it would it would try to bring everything in front. Of so I'll shoot it in shallow. But you know, if you had blue skies and all this, and I don't think. Is that the I'm sorry. Is that the or Absolutely or not. Yeah. Six hundred is yeah. totally the best right thought you can get. Yeah. Yes. I used to get those, even though it made it deadly. And I just had to ship it back early this year to get my plastic sleeves replaced, and it took three months. Oh, I had all the crap on. Okay. Ready, Kim? Okay. Let's do let's do the photos here. <laughs> we 
Okay. <laughs> okay, let's do some. Did you all sign the attendance sheet just in case? Yeah. 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 Okay. I've got it. Right. MJ would be proud of us. Hi, MJ. Who took that? Me. That's um, Gates Pass out in Arizona. I went out to Arizona. A uh, month or so ago to uh, visit my daughter. She's at the uh, uh, University of Arizona. She's uh, getting her doctorate from cello. And we went out for a concert she was doing. And we told her, uh, this is on the, the west side of Tucson in the mountains. And there it goes down into a valley. But um, in April, the uh, flowers were all in bloom. And uh, it's a pretty cool place to go. I love the rule of birds on that path. Then when we left uh, in Tucson, we headed north and we uh, went up through Sedona and some beautiful scenery in Sedona. A cool place to go. Uh, then as we went further on, uh, we went up to the left there. You can see that road coming along that road through that valley and then up that windy road on the right. Uh, very windy. Exactly. On the switchbacks to get up top, and then there was a uh, a place where you could pull off and get a uh, a shot of the valley, which was pretty cool. That was, I think, that was a three shot panorama. Then we uh, continued on up to um, uh, the Grand Canyon. I've never been there before. This was our first trip. My wife and I are like, why did we wait to get to in our 70s to the Grand Canyon? <laughs> But um, the first night I got there, there were a lot of clouds. The only thing I didn't like about that is that they put a lot of you know dark blotches down, uh, which, which made it a little bit difficult. But then um, the next day, the lot, uh, we didn't have the clouds, so I had you know a little bit better lighting for that. Uh, you know, the shadow allowed you to see things, but uh, took a lot of panoramas. When I was there, it, uh, the scenery was kind of called out for it. And then this is a this is also a panorama, but down vertically because I wanted to show the depth in the canyon there. What was your lens on? Did you have a light? I was using a twenty four to one hundred five. Uh, and then this was um toward the the first couple were on the western side of the canyon. This was off to the east. And uh, you can see the Colorado River there coming toward you. Uh, that was a pretty cool, pretty cool place. These are all from the South Rim? All from the South Rim. Yeah, the North Rim wasn't open. Uh, the North Rim doesn't open until May because of the, because of the weather. When, when yeah. was there? Yeah, it was there in April. Yeah. What uh, you know, I love the North Rim. I haven't, yeah, I haven't. And, uh, they, uh, last time I was there, they would open, but there wasn't anything open. I you see. You drive in, but you're on your own. Yeah. And it was a pretty long drive from the south. From the oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so this is back to that same place. I went for a sunset. Um, and uh, this was a five-shot HDR because uh, it was a very bright sun, and the uh, canyon was pretty dark by that point. Uh, but, that was an HDR shot for the sunset. And this was uh, looking out across the canyon as it was getting close to sunset, it was getting the uh, kind of the stacked mountains. And this was uh, hmm. just a, uh, not taking pictures. Uh, she was actually taking pictures of some kids who were there. But, uh, and then there's, this was. Uh, when I got home, I had a pair of tulip that had bloomed while I was gone, and I was lucky enough to still get some photographs of it. So I took this one when I got home. Oh, was that on a black? 
the yeah. acrylic? That was a sheet of black, okay. black acrylic, yes. Uh, and then this was a um, uh, vulnerable exposure of a cactus. I uh, just changed the uh, angle a little bit between exposures. And this was a uh, a bearded iris from my garden that had bloomed. And then this was a Dutch iris from my garden as well. And then this was in Shenandoah last week. I went out because it's uh, wildflowers had bloomed out. This past weekend was their official wildflower weekend. They had a lot of activities, but uh, the, the one uh, trail that I was on, uh, I knew it would have a lot of wildflowers. So they, I got this jack in the pulpit there. And then the next morning, uh, it, it had rained that night. So I got up early in the morning to get out and see if I could find a sunrise. Uh, but the, it was very foggy when I first got out, but I eventually got to some overlooks where I was able to get, you know, the, some scenery with the fog and so forth, which, which I liked a lot. And then this was uh, heading back up to the big meadow where I was staying. And uh, the, pot, the fog was very patchy. You go through clear areas and then you hit patches of fog. And so I was uh, stopping, taking pictures through the windshield. Then I got to the big meadow and the fog was really heavy. It was really thick fog. So I uh, walked up into the meadow and I was taking uh, photographs of the trees in the fog. Which was pretty cool. And then this was um, about 15 to 20 minutes later, the fog was just clearing as I was there, it was just, just blowing away. And so you can see the clouds moving off to the, the left as it uh, <laughs> clear. And then this is looking out through the big meadow after the uh, fog. Right. It was a good morning. And then this was a uh, peony from my garden at home. Is that stopped? It is. Okay, so these are mine, and I'm going to be embarrassed with our speaker here, I'm sure. But anyway, these are from, I recently took a trip to Costa Rica with some friends. And um, of course, in Costa Rica, everything is Pura Vida. And there was a sign there, and there were many, many hummingbirds. And so I caught this little hummer on the sign, and I liked it. That was at one of the places we stayed. So all of these are hummingbirds. And in Virginia, we only have one species of hummingbird, which is the ruby-throated hummingbird. And um, in Costa Rica, there are dozens. So this is called a um, white-necked Jacobin. And that is the male with the, with the um, blue head and white belly. And they would, per they, they have feeders but then the, they have lots of um, flowering plants everywhere too. So the hummers would go to the feeder sometimes and would feed on the flowers sometimes and so, um, and would perch on these little twigs. So I don't remember the name of this one, but anyway, so, so this, this is just to show how, um, how really beautiful each little, each little feather is and depending on the light, that head can look, you know, the head and neck can look black, but then if the light hits it right, you get these iridescent, gorgeous colors, okay? This is um, another one just showing its beautiful colors. This was a white-throated mountain gem, I think is the name of this one. This is a tiny, tiny, tiny bird called a scintillant um, and when the light is it looks all kind of brown and olive but when the light shines the right way on its neck the neck is like a brilliant gold color but I thought it was cute that was cute this is a green 
a violet ear hummingbird, which I thought was one of my favorites there. And, um, you know, sometimes you can catch them in flight and and they're not blocked by all the other vegetation. What scatter speed? Do you know what scatter speed you have now? Um, I think that, can, do you, can you pull up the info? I think it was 1,000. 1, oh, okay. Um, you did well with the point. Uh, yeah, well, there were a lot that were not as good. Oh, one four thousand, not one. Know. Yeah, but a lot of them I was doing at like one one thousand because there wasn't enough light, you know. That was the R five. Yes, with the one hundred five hundred lens. Mm -hmm. This is called a fiery throated hummingbird, and you can see that it's got a um, like a rainbow colored uh, gorget. I think it's called gorget. 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 Um, and this is the same kind of bird, but in a different light. And you can see how different the coloration looks. This is the um, green violet ear again. And this is um, a this is a female white throated mountain gem. And this is my last one, and it is it's um, it didn't come out so well on here, but it is just a vivid purple bird. And it's a um, it's about maybe four inches long. And it's called a violet saber wing. You can see it's about to impale itself on that thorn too. <laughs> oh, yeah. But anyway, that was uh, that was a lot of fun to try to get the summers. Right. Thanks, thanks. We we went through a travel agency. Oh God. <laughs> All right, well, Kemp is um, going to open that up. I, as a personal project, I wanted to work on flash photography because I don't like using this. It's an extra thing to carry, and I had no idea how to use it. So I forced myself to use it, and now I don't think I can go without it. And these are just some shots that I took indoors with my Flash because I thought, okay, maybe I can fix it up in post if I have a shallow, you know, uh, a good lens, I could do it. But uh, Gabby at one of the restaurants, and go ahead, Cam. I've forgotten his name. I think his name is Alec. But also, I just wanted to preface instead of just taking a face or a person, I wanted to connect them with something so that you would know a little bit about them. Um, and this is uh, Amy at the jewelry shop. Oh, you can tell. Hopefully, you can tell. Um, this is our friend Derek and his truck and his camper are very important to him. He was a caregiver to his mom, and every once in a while, he would just have to get off the grid, and his sister would take over. So at this point, he said he'd been off the grid for about a hundred days. So. Um, uh, garage owner. They, they've all been very gracious and allowed me to take this and you can hear it. I, I've dropped this flash three times already and it's still working. <laughs> My car is held together with tape and I have purchased another <laughs> because I'm sure this is not going to be with me much longer. But I, I also, it forced me to put that flash not just on the camera, but I had to put it on a tripod and move it somewhere and use triggers, which I've had in a box for years. And I was like, oh, I didn't know I had these and what are these? So just recently in April, it forced me to use this thing with the, you guys who've done this with studio quote photography, you all know this, but it was very intimidating to me. That's not real, it's not, none of these are like harsh looking like. Right, I mean, um, I would angle it, yeah. I'm trying to, like, did it fire, you know, and I'm turning it around. So um, Dwayne and everybody in that garage said, would you hurry up lady and get out of here? But we've known, you know, Santa Claus for 30 years. So 
If you've been down in Carytown, you probably have seen this artist there. He's near the Bird Theater. He's self-taught. Uh, he's uh, you know been painting for 26 years, and it's just amazing the people who are self-taught. But again, all with flashes, all with this as my project. Go ahead, Kevin. And this is actually, I had called my daughter up. thought, where did you get these tattoos? I think that would be a really great place to go. And they were very gracious. And I wanted her to, you know, hold something. Just don't pose what instrument. I figured they're using the staple gun, the ear piercing. No, and she pulled this thing out. I said, okay, whatever. And again, they were very, uh, very gracious. And uh, Dave down at River City was another one. And you know, I had my little tripod. Okay, wait, can you let me move this here and <laughs> let me let me angle it somewhere else? And again, they're very gracious, very, very lovely. Had to turn that into black and white. It just felt like I needed to. <laughs> and this one was also with the flash and um, no guts, no glory. I'm gonna make mistakes along the way. Uh, but the skateboarders there that they were were also very nice. You know, so in any case. I don't think I'm going to go anywhere without this now that I somehow am not as intimidated with it as I used to be. And I remember at our last meeting, there were at least three, and I was the fourth, maybe the fifth, who said, no, I don't like to use a flash. And I, I, I just mm -hmm. don't have a need for it. Or one, one of that gal said, no, I know that's one thing I need to look at. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so in any great. case, it inspired me to share some of my images. Great set. Yeah, great. Oh, these are these are mine. I follow the uh, the street assignment, literally in this case. Um, this is the Ucrops 10K at seven o'clock in the morning. And, and you, you have never seen Monument Avenue that empty. The, the only, only the only sight was this this, this bike. And, and then an hour and a half later, uh, ten thousand people show up, and including the spectators. I like this one. I have no idea who she's cheering on, but she was quite active, quite amazing. The best, the, the best thing, thing about it is you haven't gone and shared it. Every block had a rock band. Every block. And, and not only a rock band, band but an old guy. guy. <laughs> <laughs> they were all playing, they were all playing things from the 60s and 70s and having a great time. You can see this is at the turn where the runners are turning around and heading back into the city. And uh, they, they just played on and on and on. This is another band. Uh, I felt right at home with all these great guys. guys. And, and just, just a shot of a couple of bands cheering somebody on. on. This is uh, literally another street scene. This is at uh, Dawn, downtown, his street in town. town. Car show. Guy showing his car and having his lunch. Easter, 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 uh, a hunt, and she looked up at the precise right moment. And I like this, I like this one. Uh, if you want to impart some symbolism to it, I suppose you can. Uh, state capital and some. Visitors. She studied for final exam at the University of Richmond. That was that was at a women's cross seat. I was sitting on one side. Those were the sit at the stadium. The seats on the other side. They were not drawing much of a crowd that day. <laughs> Whatever give you that idea. Well, they came to see you. No, I, I just. I just, I just thought, thought there, there were the only people on the other side of the stadium for the entire afternoon. Did you have a wedding dress on? I don't think so. 
just one, one of the uh, downtown characters that I came across in front of the library. I just love the shape of the, uh, the very shape of the head and the tunes. And again, that was probably one of the Philippine festivals, something or other, just from the rear of the key. And those are my street shots. All right. Uh, physically, I'm not exactly what I was, but I'm a hell of a lot better than I used to be. Okay. And uh, I got uh, invited to Chicago for my uh, great granddaughter's graduation. She was getting her master's degree and something. But uh, spent a lot of time in the hotel room just for a couple of days. So I just shot pictures out with the window. And I was across the street. I just thought it was kind of interesting the way it was laid out, the building. And uh, I, uh, there's that window up there, there's a little bit of black in it. Um, I had that black out that window because it had something goofy in it. But I was so tempted to put somebody in that window, put the decade of jumping. Oh, I, didn't. <laughs> I, didn't, I just put that in there to have something to do. Thank you. And, uh, and of course, if you know me, uh, the uh, the this is from Santa Gamaya, and uh, the uh, model there uh, was something I saw in uh, Santa Fe years ago, and it was kind of uh, different. And uh, as I mentioned before, if I'm someplace where I'm not inspired to try something different, I will shoot backgrounds. So that's a background that I shot uh, down in Petersburg. And sort of pasted them all together here from Cinco de Mayo Day. So anyway, that's my input. Uh, that is uh, my photo uh, on the theme of uh, street photography. And uh, I like the uh, juxtaposition of the old couple uh, and the uh, tuxedo couple with open in the uh, window. Hmm. Uh, this is out of Neymar. Yeah. I thought these uh, two women looked pretty exotic uh, and uh, fashionable, so uh, I took this shot. Uh, I titled this Leaking Out, and uh, it's uh, Reflections. When I took the shot, I didn't realize that I would get this juxtaposition of the leaves coming out of the head. <laughs> but uh, it turned out to be uh, an interesting shot. Down in uh, Chaco Bottom. Uh, I like the hand of the uh, I like the, the uh, foreground, the cigarette and the cell phone, and uh, the ninja bike. Uh, having a smoke. Uh, this is in Churchill. I call this one sharing a joint. Oh, okay. If you look closely, <laughs> yeah, I think in the right. center of the frame, there we go. Yeah. Looks like a joint. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> title of this one is High Horse. <laughs> Who said more? <laughs> 
uh, looks like they're having a kind of a serious talk uh, in an outdoor restaurant. Yeah. The little boy uh, seems to be looking up and saying, is this okay, Dad? Or what next, Dad? Uh, I was actually just trying to take a picture with that too. Not the little boy as well. And uh, here again, uh, I like the expression on the little boy's face of the mom is looking up at something. Uh, this is down on uh, right off uh, East Main, next to the Library of Virginia, and uh, homeless people. It's uh, fairly common downtown Virginia. I was I was actually kind of surprised when I saw it. So early in the morning. I call this the uh, Night Watchman. Uh, this is about at 8 o'clock, and uh, just about closing time. And I uh, uh, saw the crack in the door and uh, the fish shot. Uh, this is a portrait of a deer. Down on uh, Broad Street. And a uh, food truck on East Broad. Hmm. All right, David Madden, this is along Cary Street. Remains of a bike. Looks like they stole everything but the, <laughs> but the yeah. brain. So, yeah. And I call this one Who's Walking Who? <laughs> yeah. And uh, as a, a musician along Cary Street. This is a ballerina out in front of uh, Main Street Station. She's right out in the middle of the street. There, so we got to do the lead for me. It's great. Oh. We're right there. Yeah. I, I love the, the look at the, the people there watching her. And uh, this is. Uh, Girl was posing for a picture from uh, taking my friend, and I asked her if I could take her picture too. So she posed for me. Is that a gun barrel in her other hand? Do what? Is that a gun barrel in her hand? No, it's a cell phone. <laughs> oh, okay. That's good. <laughs> so then you might be in trouble. <laughs> this is my photograph. Uh, this was taken. Um, along the way, uh, Madge was in, engaging in some retail therapy that day and happened to catch this guy. Uh, anybody who's been to Santa Fe know there's more art there than I think anywhere else on the planet. And uh, just happened to catch this guy. Um, in the town square, uh, if you've been there, there's a, a park in the center. And on three sides, there's uh, retail stores and restaurants. And on the one side, there is little more than just an overhang and a sidewalk. And on the weekends, these Navajos gather there to sell their jewelry. And um, uh, I happened to catch, I think there's probably 50, 60 of them underneath of there. And they were such nice people. And I, I caught this guy's photograph. Uh, one of the makers and this lady here. But this shows what nice, I wanted to show how nice they were. That's, oh. That's all. That's, That's it. it. That's okay. It. Yeah. Kent, do you have um, a minute for, for something else I wanted to show? I've got it on the thumb drive. If you got a time, it, it won't take but a couple minutes.
Um, I, uh, I was telling Sue a little earlier, uh, one of the projects that I did some time ago was converting like 20,000 slides over to digital. And in doing so, uh, which I needed therapy afterwards, um, <clears throat> I ran across only two pictures, two images of both my father, uh, my son, and I. And uh, let's see, start with A there. I just wanted to show this is the first time. This is the original slide. I had a little more hair then, it was a little taller. And notice, you know, this is typical. I did not take this, but the, there's no feet. It's a pretty, not a very good picture. Uh, go to the next one. So here it is, I cropped it a little bit and I had some that reflection there, but notice there were no feet. So I just took and got in the uh, selection, put a box at the bottom there and hit generative fill. Next one. <laughs> Isn't that something? Okay, and this was really the first time I ever used it. Okay, now the next one is a little bit different. Uh, this is uh, obviously I was taken, I think we took this in Ocean City, Maryland. That's my daughter, uh, her three children, uh, her husband. And I had to uh, uh, take the former roommate out of the right side of the picture. And in doing the aspect ratio to print it, I had this blank space on the left. So I'm like, gee, I wonder if generative fill could do anything with that. Now notice the picture at the top, top left. Notice the lamp, the lamp shade, and notice the table. Okay, bring up the next one. I thought that was really amazing. It filled that in for me. So mm -hmm. anyway, it based on what I saw with Sue did with the, with this. Um, I decided to try that, and I was uh, I was really surprised at the results. Uh, by the way, the story behind this is my daughter really did marry a, a preacher. Ron is a, a minister, and the story is they were having some financial troubles, and they invited a relative from Chicago to do some collections. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think we're that it, Ken? That's it. That's it. Thank you, everybody, who contributed photographs. Um, don't forget to get your. Don't forget to get your thumb drive. And uh, as I said, the channel for the next meeting, the next meeting is close us. So get close. That's, That's it. Thanks, thanks for coming. coming. Thank you, Keith. Hey, Thank you. Is it Takahoe? I think it's Takahoe. That's mine. I know, but I want to use it for the news. Oh, whatever. Thank you. 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 Thank you.